Welcome to this Beyond Zero e-learning module. This is one of the BITS RHI catch-up map modules. Um, this particular module is on the management of the complicated pregnant patient. We're running through some cases, and this is the STI case. So we're going to be speaking about Mrs. XN. Let's tell you a little bit about her story. So she's a 30 years old woman, um, and she presents at the antenatal clinic with a complaining of a burning feeling on her private parts. Two days after the burning started, she noticed the development of some pimples and the lesions are painful. And she remembers having similar symptoms about a year ago and these lesions had resolved spontaneously. She's a power two gravid at three and she's currently 32 weeks pregnant. She's HIV positive and she's been on ARVs for three years, currently on Denofovir, 3TC and Avirapine, one of the older regimens. Her latest blood results show a CD4 count of 203 and she's got a viral load of 1,315. So although she's disclosed her status to her boyfriend, Mr. NG, she's not yet, he has not yet tested. And he believes that because Mrs. XNN is positive, he must also be positive, um, and therefore they've been not been using any condoms during intercourse. So a complicated story, but we're going to start off just um, dealing with her presenting complaint, which is what she calls these pimples, um, on the private parts. We haven't looked at them yet, but let's just start looking at what's going through the back of our minds from a, from a differential diagnosis point of view. Um, so if we're thinking about genital lumps, um, genital warts, very common, might be molluscum contagiosum, um, it might be condylomata lata, but there might also be non-STI causes such as folliculitis or lichen planus, uh, more rarer, keratoacanthoma, or they might even be um, carcinoma, very unlikely in somebody this young, um, but part of the differential for complete, completeness sake. Uh, if one thinks about ulceration, so when somebody describes as a pimple, can either be more of a lump or more of an ulcer. We're obviously firstly thinking about herpes, uh, which are often preceded by vesicles or lumps before they become ulcers. Syphilis, and that's of course primary syphilis. Some of your tropical causes, such as chancroid or lymphogranuloma venerum or granuloma inguinala. Um, and then, of course, again, some in, might not be STI-related at all, such as neoplasia, some drug reactions, such as your Steven Johnson syndrome, Betch's disease, quite rare, um, but it can also have ulcers on that area, um, and, of course, trauma. So now when you have a look, you found that there's multiple small vesicles on the vulva and the perineum. And also because of her history of repetition, you think it's pretty likely that she has genital herpes. So let's assume we had an ideal clinical situation with all the resources at hand. How would we actually confirm that this is genital herpes? Um, and there's, various, there's a variety of tests available. So one can actually do a viral culture where you would grow the organism. Uh, one can do antibodies. Of course, the problem with herpes simplex antibodies is that they are positive for life. So you wouldn't be able to tell if this was a recurrent episode or might still be from a previous episode. But there are very good, actually, direct viral antigen detection tests, as well as PCR-based viral detections available. Um, but these are available in private and not in the public sector. So in a typical South African clinic, um, how would we diagnose genital herpes, and we're going to talk a little bit about the advantages and disadvantages of this specific approach. So, of course, largely it is based on a clinical diagnosis, but actually in a clinical setting, we'd be going to be using syndromic management. So even though you might say, oh, I think this is possibly genital herpes, you're going to be treating the patient syndromically because we're not actually able to confirm that diagnosis with a lab test. Um, and the particular uh, algorithm you're going to be following for this patient will be genital ulcer syndrome. We'll look at that a little bit more in a minute. But let's just talk just quickly two slides on this syndromic. So what are some of the advantages of using syndromic management as we are doing in the public sector? Uh, probably the most important is it's actually by far the cheapest way of managing STIs. So, and that is mainly because you're avoiding very costly laboratory tests for a wide range of possible infections. It also acknowledges that our clinical diagnoses are not very reliable. So just looking at a discharge or an ulcer, um, quite often we might get it wrong. 
It also gives the possibility that you can treat the patient on the day that they present with their symptoms. So you don't have the issue of now having sent swaps um, and having the patient to come back. And most importantly, you're going to be treating mixed infections. So although you might see one infection, um, it's very possible that there might be other infections as well. And syndromic treatment quite often manages uh, a few of those. But there are some disadvantages as well. Um, although it's cheaper, it's not necessarily the most cost-effective way of managing STIs, um, as you will be treating potentially for infections that the patient might not even have. Um, in the same vein, the patient might therefore be getting unnecessary antibiotics, so they might only have thrush, but you're now treating them for both thrush and chlamydia um, and other possible causes, uh, and so you are therefore over-treating potentially their infection. Some of the syndromes, um, actually, the, the algorithms work much better than others. So, for example, gentle ulcer syndrome and male urethritis syndrome manage, is very easy and manages very well with syndromic treatment. But we find that vaginal discharge syndrome, not quite as well. Many STIs are asymptomatic, so they may be missed when we're using syndromic management. So in your typical place where you would do laboratory investigations of STIs, you would do swaps for everything. Um, and therefore, you might find some asymptomatic underlying STIs. And of course, it might not be an STI at all. So when you're doing syndromic STI treatment, you are making an assumption that is an STI. Um, the patient now gets told that they have an STI. And for example, something like vaginal thrush might not be um, STI related at all. So this is an example of our gentle ulcer syndrome algorithm. Um, and they're fairly simple and they're very self-explanatory. So in a patient who has ulcers, um, you would firstly check whether they've been sexually active. If they haven't been sexually active in the last three months, it's very unlikely to be a recent um, sexually transmitted infection. And it's more likely to be one of your um, old infections that's repeated. And the most common one there is most certainly genital herpes. So in patients like this, we would treat them with acyclovir, 400 milligrams TDS for seven days. And very important there to check your HIV positive status, which will um, increase the risk of herpes recurring. But if your patient has been sexually active within the last three months, it's also possible that they might have a primary syphilis. And therefore, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be treating them firstly for primary syphilis. You're going to give them their course of penicillin. Um, and if they're HIV positive or have unknown HIV status, um, or symptoms very suspicious of herpes, you're going to be adding in your acyclovir. So you'll be treating for both. Very important if the ulcers are painful, as they will be with gentle herpes, to also bring in your pain relief. And then with syndromic treatment, it's absolutely essential to follow up the patient to make sure you've actually um, managed the, the problem. So a week later, you need to check, are these ulcers definitely getting better? And if there's no improvement, um, we will add in azithromycin at this point, one gram as a single dose. Uh, and again, if they don't respond to that, we've now treated all our main causes of gentle ulcers, and you're going to be referring um, for further investigations at this point. So there are a few little notes at the bottom that is specific to do with patients who are penicillin allergic. So that's quite important um, in patients where you are suspecting primary syphilis, uh, which we normally then treat with doxycycline, but you can't use doxycycline in pregnant women. And I just want to highlight there, in your pregnant women, they actually, um, if they are allergic to penicillin, they are recommending penicillin desensitization, which is something we don't do in practice. And we would probably use erythromycin in those patients as per the old guidelines. Let's get back to our patient who we are concerned about might have herpes. And remember, she is pregnant. Um, and so herpes carries its own specific risks, not only specifically in a pregnant woman, but in a pregnant woman who's immunosuppressed. So firstly, there's actually an attack. There's actually a risk to the woman itself um, during her pregnancy. For the herpes can complicate and become disseminated. So for example, you can get um, uh, herpes meningitis. You can get a sacral radiculopathy, so they will have like a coda equina kind of a syndrome. You can get a transverse myelitis um, or actual disseminated infection of herpes. So they can become very, very sick, and especially if they're not on ARVs 
or have very low CD4 counts. But there's also a risk that the actual fetus can um, become infected whilst still whilst the mom's still pregnant, and this can lead to both miscarriage or preterm later labor. Uh, interesting to note that it's not related to actual specific congenital defects, but can have an outcome, uh, an effect on the pregnancy. But there's also a risk that the baby can get infected during delivery. So um, if the mom has got vaginal herpes, there might be, um, and especially if she has a primary maternal infection, so she's had herpes for the first time, there's about a 50% risk that the baby is going to get infected. Also interesting to notice, if it's a recurrent herpes attack, the risk is much, much lower. If the baby is going to um, be infected with herpes during delivery, they will present with neonatal herpes already within the first two weeks of life. 25% of them might just have herpes of the eyes, so they get dendritic ulcers on the conjunctiva or herpes in the mouth. But 70% of these babies can have widely disseminated herpes with an extremely high uh, mortality rate. And many of these survivors can have long-term problems, including mental retardation. The take-home message here is the incredible importance to properly um, examine and question our patients close to labor or during labor to really look for this, for risk of STIs and particularly herpes. And remember, these will be women who've had their first only ever attack of herpes shortly before delivery. So we've been treating the STI, which is great, but we also obviously have to look at all the other things going on. And one of the important things to note there was that viral load that was slightly increased, just over a thousand. And we're going to go through our ABCD that we cover with all our viral load failures, starting off obviously with adherence, checking that she's taking a treatment. But in this patient, I would be considering the fact that the STI might have led to a viral load blip. Um, and we can see that with opportunistic infections that your immune system temporarily can't multitask, and you might have a, a short time of increase of viral load. And the correct dose is not relevant in this particular patient. But drug interactions, if somebody has an infection, they might have been taking other medications over the counter that might have um, also led to interactions with the ARVs. The question always come up, maybe this is a reinfection from the partner. They're obviously not using condoms as she has contracted an STI and he's obviously also at risk of infection. Um, if the patient does have HIV and it's a drug sensitive HIV, it's unlikely that that would lead to a viral load blip as the ARVs that the patient is on will be able to deal with those quite nicely. If the partner, however, has a drug um, resistant HIV, she might have been reinfected with a drug-resistant strain that can start to put the viral load up. Um, but the next question is, is what are we now going to do about this viral load um, today? So she's already on to Nofibu 3 3TC and Navarapine. She is pregnant and she has a high CD4 count and that viral load is 1,315. So we want to manage a viral load, but we're also nervous about her being on Navarapine. Um, as we know, we don't like nevirapine used in pregnancy, and we're always concerned about the high CD4 count. So generally, it's considered good practice. If patients are nevirapine, unless they've got a severe active mental health illness, we're going to try and change those patients um, to the, to the uh, nefavirin-based regimen. But we all know that there's a rule that we do not do single substitutions unless the viral load is LDL. And what's important and what I want to illustrate in this patient is that this is exceptions to the rules. And nevirapine and efavirenz are one of those exceptions. So they share very similar mutations. Um, and so switching from one to the other, even with an increased viral load, is not going to lead to additional or new mutations. So even if there isn't a mutation against nevirapine, um, it's not going to jeopardize the efavirenz any more than it would already have. So in this kind of a patient, we can certainly consider using the fixed dose combination. But let's move on to a development in our story. Mr. NS finally decides that he is going to come in and test, and his test comes back HIV negative. So how would you explain this discordant result? Um, and I think it's very important to give patients clear messages. And the message generally out there is that HIV is this incredibly infective virus um, and that as soon as you have sex with somebody who's HIV positive, you will become infected. 
But of course, this is not the case. There is a lot of uh, factors that will influence on how infected you are. So for example, even if a patient is not yet on ARVs, um, if they are very well and they're on the early stages of their illness, they pass that primary infection, what we find is that the viral load comes down to what we call a viral load set point. So in the first two, three weeks when you are infected, the viral load might very well go up to the millions, and then obviously the risk of transmission is as high as one in three. But once the viral load has come down, the risk of transmission per sexual act is between one and 200 to one in 1,000. And you can quite often have couples who've been together for years, and yet the one partner did not get infected with HIV. Of course, in this particular partner, she's been on ARVs um, for some time, so there is a good chance that her viral load has been suppressed most of that time with a very little risk to, to the partner. Um, and it's therefore important to now also just to ensure that Mr. Ines stays HIV negative and to look at the factors that might contribute to him getting infected in the future. And there's a few key strategies. And important to note that at the moment, our most important prevention strategy is to focus on the wife. So making sure her viral load is LDL is going to be important. And we'll do this rather than pre-exposure prophylaxis. So if you have one partner on um, ARVs, then we'll focus on getting her viral load suppressed. And it's not necessary to also now put the man on pre-exposure prophylaxis. We would only use pre-exposure prophylaxis where we're not sure of the, st of the status of the partner or whether the partner is on ARVs. But of course, we have to talk about condom use and the effectiveness of it. Um, and that even though the viral load, if a viral load is suppressed, the risk is very low. But of course, if she gets infections like the STI, might cause blips in the viral load, um, and there is sometimes therefore a risk. So throughout, one would still recommend condom use. Um, and don't forget to mention medical male circumcision. So in the foreskin of the man, there are these islands of Langerhans that are filled with dendritic cells. Um, and dendritic cells are one of the great um, vehicles that HIV uses to get to the lymph nodes to infect the CD4 count. So when one does a circumcision, one dramatically reduces the risk of HIV transmission from the woman to the man um, and is certainly worth um, uh, offering. So where are we at with our lady? So we've decided to switch her to tenofovir imidrosipitabine and efeverance. We've treated her herpes. And we repeated the viral load in one month. So remember, if the viral load is high, you check your ABCD, you check one month later. So she's doing all right. And she delivers a nice, normal, healthy baby. Now she comes in for the six weeks postpartum visit. And she tells us that Mr. NG, her partner, is still refusing to use condoms. And he insists they try and fall pregnant again immediately. Obviously, he likes the baby. She says that she might consider having a last born in a few years' time, but for now she would like to concentrate on a new baby and on retaining her own health. And we are now going to discuss the possible contraceptive options for her. So we now have somebody who's HIV positive, on ARVs, breastfeeding um, with a small baby. And there's also the, the, the challenge of a partner who might not be very open to her being on contraception. So with breastfeeding um, and ARVs, there is an option to use the progesterone-only pill, um, but that might be a challenge with a boyfriend. Um, interesting to note, you can't use those with second line because of the return of a boosting. But we cannot use the normal contraceptive, um, oral contraceptive pill due to the estrogen, as it can have an effect on the breastfeeding. Be careful to recommend lactational amenorrhea as a contraceptive method. So that's the old-fashioned way of saying, well, if you're not having periods while you're breastfeeding, um, you will not fall pregnant. Certainly, it's a much, much reduced risk of pregnancy, but there is still a, a risk. Um, of course, within the public sector, our favorite methods are using our long-acting reversible contraceptive methods. Depo-Provera and Neresterate, probably still the most commonly used uh, we were hoping, at big hopes for the implant, but remember that the implanon is currently not routinely recommended for women taking the virapine, efavirenz, or a PI. It's not actually completely contraindicated. So although um, when you use the implanon with some of your um, ARVs as well as your protease inhibitors, although it can certainly have an impact on its effectiveness, so you, you have a higher risk of falling pregnant, 
that risk is actually no higher um, than some of your, than for example, the, the oral contraceptive pill. So it reduces the effectiveness of the implanin, but it doesn't take that effectiveness away at all. If, for example, if you're using the implanin with condoms, it's still an extremely good form of contraception. And of course, my particular favorite is the intrauterine contraceptive device. It's an excellent option. There's no interactions with any of the ARVs. It only needs to be replaced every five years. Um, and best of all, when they, you remove it, the woman is immediately uh, fertile again. So for women who are planning to have babies in the future, this could be a very good option. Also remember that it's been six weeks since the delivery and that she now once again must have her pup smear done at this visit. But let's say it's now a year or so down the line. Um, Mr. Inez has convinced his wife that it's time to try for another baby. She is still HIV positive and he is HIV negative. So how would your advice change at this point um, in terms of conceiving where the woman is HIV positive and the man is HIV negative? So the best protection, as I've mentioned earlier, is still focusing on your HIV positive partner. So making sure your partner is virally suppressed and there's no need for PrEP in the, in the husband then during this time. But of course, you're not going to be using condoms all the time. What you do want to do, though, is say, let's use condoms during the times when you're not fertile um, and you only have unprotected intercourse during the fertile period. And how do we help our women identify when they are fertile in the cycle? because the, the, amount, the fertile period will vary depending on the length of women's cycles. And I'm going to teach you a very simple calculation that we use for women also who are trying to fall pregnant. Um, to determine your fertile period, you're going to take the average length of the cycle. So say, let's say she's got a 32-day cycle, for example, or a 35-day cycle, and you're going to minus 20 from that cycle, and you're going to minus 10 from that cycle. So let me give an example. Let's say her cycle is 32 days. 32 minus 20 is 12. So that's the first day from which she is fertile. And 32 minus 10 is 22. So she is fertile from day 12 until day 22 in her, circle, in her cycle potentially. And you can see that 10 days gives enough um, scope or play that we are going to hit that seven-day fertile Time that we are fertile during during the woman female cycle. So all you need to tell your patient is that on the first day of the period she needs to mark day one on her calendar. They use condoms until day 11. They don't use condoms between day 12 and 22, and from day 23 they can use condoms again. We spoke earlier about medical male circumcision, um, and then so I have not yet had a couple that's actually taken this on. But self-insemination is a simple, easy way for, especially when the man is feeling uh, very um, nervous about having unprotected intercourse. Um, it's very simple that you just draw up the semen in a syringe. The woman can do that at home. You give her a 20 ml syringe. There's no sterilization or anything like that needed. And she can self-inseminate herself with that. Um, for more details on all of those, there's an, actually an excellent guideline that was published in the South African Journal of HIV Medicine in June of 2011. It's called the Guideline on Safer Conception in Fertile HIV-Infected Individuals and Couples. They run through all the different options. They've got some lovely tables, um, and there's also some good information on self-insemination in that, easy to um, access online. Thank you very much. Please do see our other modules on complicated cases. We have a case on TB HIV in a pregnant woman. Um, as well as a case on biological failure.